Commander James Mulligan, squadron commander on the aircraft carrier Enterprise. Commander James Bond Stockdale, squadron commander on the aircraft carrier Oriskany. Colonel Norman C. Gaddis, squadron commander at Takli Air Base. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Albert Larson, 338th Fighter Squadron at Korat. Colonel Edward B. Burdett. He was also a squadron commander at Korat. Colonel John P. Flynn, squadron commander at Cameron Air Base. Commander James P. Mell. He also commanded a squadron on an aircraft carrier. Colonel Nelson William Humphrey, deceased since 20 July 1966, was also a squadron commander of the Air Force here in Da Nang, South Vietnam. Colonel Robinson Reisner, the most famous squadron commander among those shot down so far. He was chosen to celebrate a prominent event in American aviation history. In 1927, Charles A. Lindbergh flew the first non-stop flight across the Atlantic Ocean in his spirit of St. Louis in 33 and a half hours. 30 years later, Robinson Reisner flew the same distance in his Super Sabre in six hours and 38 minutes. A famous flyer in 1927, Charles A. Lindbergh. A famous flyer of 1957, Robinson Reisner. Colonel Reisner is also the holder of other U.S. aviation records. In 1957, where World News Service, Facts on File, listed the famous name twice. We were not the first film team to speak to the Colonel. An American film team of NBC interviewed the famous commander of the 67th Tactical Squadron in Da Nang. At that time, Reisner also gave a sober and matter-of-fact evaluation of the Vietnamese air defense. Well, actually, the fire that you see is in the minority, I would suppose. Uh, it's mostly the stuff you don't see that gets you. You can see the uh, heavy anti-aircraft or the light anti-aircraft automatic fire. Uh, sometimes you can see tracers from the lighter weapons, but it's uh, some of the stuff that have no tracers and no any aircraft bursts that really get to you. The famous pilot was also put on the cover of the largest U.S. news magazine. <laughs> Who's fighting in Vietnam? A gallery of American combatants. This is how we met him, bareheaded. This is how he's known to America, a Thunder Chief. The Thunder Chief's proud ornament. Our Vietnamese friends gave it to us as a souvenir. 
The coat of arms of Reisner and his pilots, a fighting cock. You commanded the 67th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Korat, Thailand. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. How many airplanes are assigned to such a squadron? Uh, they vary from 18 to 25. My squadron was 18. Colonel, you are a man with many years of experience, and even your assignment here in Asia represents, in principle, nothing new for you. I have, I was, uh, I participated in the Korean uh, action as well. Have you been awarded any decorations during your military career? I received uh, uh, awards, uh, the Air Medal and the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross for action in Korea. As far as I know, the Distinguished Flying Cross is one of the highest decorations awarded a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, it, it is fairly high. There are about three more above that. Uh, I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for uh, uh, my part in shooting down uh, uh, MiGs, MiG airplanes in Korea, and the Air Medals for uh, participating in a certain number of missions. That means you must have been a very successful pilot in Korea. I was very fortunate, yes. Can this luck be expressed in figures? Well, uh, I believe, uh, I believe very much, very deeply in God. I think God blessed me and uh, helped me and uh, uh, perhaps you mean, how many MiGs did I shoot down? Yes, please. Yes, uh, eight. Have you heard anything about your buddy, Lieutenant Colonel Kessler? Do you know him? I know uh, uh, Major Kessler, I believe. Uh, I, I'm not sure of his rank, but I think he's the one that I'm acquainted with is a Major Kessler. Yes, I'm, I'm acquainted with him. Kassler, now a lieutenant colonel, is considered a Korean hero in the Air Force, just as Reisner is. Do you know anything of his present condition, of his whereabouts? I do know that he is a captive here in North Vietnam, that he was shot down and captured. Yes, the prominent Air Force expert, Kassler, was also brought down by this Vietnamese pilot of a Soviet MiG. Colonel, you didn't command your 67th Tactical Fighter Squadron very long because you have been here for two years already. How many people did you lose before your capture? Yes, I think it's uh, well known here that uh, four more of my unit is also captives here. Was that the normal percentage during your command? Five losses? Uh, at the time that I was shot down uh, the second time, uh, our losses were running a little higher than the others. If I understand you correctly, you have been shot down twice. Yes. Yes, I, I was shot down once before on an attack on a radar site. The North Vietnamese uh, defense forces shot me down and I had to bail out once before. and. Uh, I bailed out at sea and was recovered by friend, my own forces. During Commander Reisner's time, the fighting cocks were stationed at this air base in Thailand. According to his own figures, his squadron had 18 Thunder Chief aircraft. Again, according to Reisner's figures in 1965, one, two, three, Four fighting cocks had already been shot out of the sky. Squadron Commander Reisner himself had to be fished out of the water once before. With this new Thunder Chief, the chief of the fighting cocks kept flying until he was irrevocably knocked out 
by 20 millimeter flak during his 44th mission. The fifth and sixth plane of the fighting cocks in 1965 was used up then by their own commander. Reisner has been in the Hilton Hanoi for over two years. And if the fighting cocks met the same fate in the years following 1965, then today none of Reisner's men are still flying. This uniform, too, was once worn by a fighting cock. Major Ronald E. Byrne followed Squadron Commander Reisner into captivity, thanks to a Soviet anti-aircraft shell which was once contained in this casing. And the photo of this man in his sorry vehicle has gone around the world by now. It has great symbolic value, for Major Gideon S. Willard II was once a fighting cock. What do you, as an officer with years of experience, think about the fact that here in Southeast Asia, the strong military power of the United States and a comparatively small people have been facing one another for years now, and that the large military machine of the United States has not been able to book a decisive victory for itself in these hostilities. Uh, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, could you uh, add to it a little bit to enlarge it? Upon it? I want to get at the moral factor of this struggle. What do you think about the will and the strength of the people here to resist? I, I believe uh, very definitely that every people of every land not only have the right but the obligation to defend their country as, with all means possible. Colonel, I ask you to please explain for us your own opinion of the value of personal freedom. Well, I, I think personal freedom is, is uh, necessary to all life. I think it's uh, worth everything. And uh, I believe that uh, personal freedom also extends to nations' freedom as well. Does a large nation have the right to force its will upon a small nation which wishes to decide itself on its way of life? Uh, all nations, it's my opinion that all nations have the right to self-determination. and No nation, simply because of its power or strength, has the right to impose their will upon another nation. Colonel Reisner, I wish to point out that there is a crass discrepancy between your opinion and the fact of your presence here in Southeast Asia. If you are of the opinion that every nation has the right to self-determination, then I fail to understand how you can attempt to bomb North Vietnam back into the Stone Age as one of your superior officers expressed it. How do you explain this discrepancy? Well, of course, as, as a military man, I can't explain political issues. I can only uh, tell you my personal feelings and give you the, my opinions as far as my limited knowledge goes. Uh, I believe that all nations do have the right of self-determination and that uh, other nations do not have the right because of power to impose their will upon others. Uh, I believe that, as you have asked about the reasons for the war in North Vietnam and South Vietnam, I think that uh, these uh, have fallen short of what was supposed to be their objective. In other words, the bombing of North Vietnam appears to have only increased the determination of the North Vietnamese people. And uh, the fighting in South Vietnam has also grown stronger. So I, I would say that the hope for objective had not been reached. Uh, it appears that uh, this is caused by the Vietnamese people uh, determination to uh, reunify their country 
and uh, as I said before, their right, uh, achieve the right of self-determination. Do you see any chance whatsoever for the United States of America to decide the outcome of this war by military force? Uh, as I said, it, uh, the, the air attacks against North Vietnam, and of course, you understand my, my knowledge is limited because of my position, but it appears from uh, uh, that the fighting only grows more determined in North Vietnam. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, eventually that we must return to the Geneva Conventions in order to settle this instead of bombing North Vietnam. A very direct question, Colonel. According to existing rules of the Code of Conduct, you are committed to answer a total of only four questions. Rank, service number, name, and date of birth. We have spoken here in detail with one another. How does this conform with your pledge to silence? Isn't it so that in our talk you have violated your directives? Yes, I definitely have. I have broken the rules of code of conduct and other things that I have been taught to respect and obey. However, my situation here is not one that uh, that I had ever anticipated, and uh, I might say I've been unable to do those things which I always thought I could and would do. Colonel Reisner, all of us here in this room are perspiring, so if you like, make use of your towel. The temperature is well over 100 degrees, and we have a very high humidity. Anyone seeing this scene could get the impression you have broken out in a cold sweat. No, I may wipe my face. The famous chief of the fighting cocks has become, in two years of captivity, a thoughtful man. This has been a period which offers time for self-meditation. At their bases, the thunder chiefs still appear as symbols of power and splendor. A look inside the shining helmets reveals, however, a shocking measure of indifference. Lieutenant Alvarez, have you taken an interest in politics during your lifetime? Uh, no, I have never had a great interest in politics, no. What are your personal interests? Do you have hobbies or is flying your main interest in life? Yes, flying and uh... I like water sports, swimming. I like all sports, football, baseball, uh, basketball. I like the sports very well. Well, uh, flying uh, is something I've wanted to do ever since I was a little boy, wanted to, wanted to fly aircraft. That's why I joined the Air Force. Then your love for flying led you to the armed forces. Yes, sir. And what you are flying for in the armed forces for which aims, that is actually of little interest to you. Well, I had a, definitely felt that by being in military service, I was uh, fulfilling an obligation to my country to, uh, I guess you would say, a patriotic service to, to protect and defend my country if I was ever called upon. But primarily, my interest in uh, flying was the reason I was in the service. What are your main interests, Lieutenant Hubbard? Do you have special hobbies? Uh, yes, sir. I enjoy uh, photography, which uh, just happens to be one of my favorite hobbies. I just sort of picked it up uh, well when I started flying reconnaissance, and I got interested in photography. And primarily, that's, I guess you'd say that's my biggest hobby, that and flying and athletics. <clears throat> Are you also interested in political affairs? No, sir. I've never taken any interest in politics and never had any desire to, to be in politics or anything. Were you a regular reader of newspapers in the United States? Well, I would say I read the, the sports page and the headlines and uh, such things as that. I'm not, I'm not a real big reader and uh, honestly never followed what was going on in the world too well. Lieutenant Torkelson, have you ever occupied yourself with political affairs? 
Oh, no, not particularly. I uh, was interested in the, uh, the politics of my country, but I was not a, uh, so to speak, an avid uh, supporter of either party. I voted every time, and I try to keep informed on the uh, government and policies and different uh, platforms and doctrines of uh, both our political parties. I wasn't uh, what you'd call a uh, real active uh, politician. Lieutenant Ringstorp, do you have political interests? I have no sir. More interested in other. Well, I having majored in, in chemistry, having majored in chemistry in college, I, I never had any political science courses, so forth. So I, I never really got interested in. Allow me to conclude that we feel you are a highly specialized but rather narrowly a specialized person. How, how do you mean that? I, I don't understand the state. Your knowledge as a pilot is certainly excellent, but you are only slightly interested in the social mechanism you are active for. With a man such as yourself, every war, even the most contemptible, is possible. Major Dewart, which personal ideals or persons have influenced your life? Uh, I assume that you're speaking of uh, uh, military people, uh, military leaders. It is possible that your ideals were, above all, members of the military, but I mean in the general sense of the word. Well, I, I'm at a loss for words. Uh, uh, all I can uh, uh, think of is uh, several uh, uh, air aces of uh, many previous wars, including some from your country, uh, such as uh, Rick Toffin uh, and uh, ha uh, Hans Knopf uh, from World War II. I read his books, and I was impressed by their uh, ability in the uh, air war, uh, and of course, uh, if we come beyond World War II, uh, we will have to go to the uh, Korean War. There were some air aces, which uh, I will not say that I know them real well, but I have met some. That, uh, that was strictly a clean-cut air battle that I'm talking about, where it was man against man. And uh, I was influenced by them. Uh, uh, you certainly know that the two best-known air races of the Korean War are sharing your fate. They more or less flew into the Hilton Hanoi, just as you did. Uh, I, uh, the reason that I am here uh, uh, is because of my enjoyment of flying. If, uh, if I had not have enjoyed it to the extent that I do, uh, I would uh, have found another uh, form of employment uh, many years ago. The love of flying, then, is what brought the Major to Vietnam. Bombs fall, explosions resound, and Major Dewart discovers in this inferno his own private and personal pleasure, his love of flying. Major Dewart, are you interested in political affairs? Uh, I'm afraid I'm a very poor politician. I probably uh, have learned more of politics in the last four months and in the rest of my life put together. Colonel Reisner, which personal ideals or persons have influenced your life mainly on the course of life that you have taken? You mean other than my wife? Yes. Um, well, I suppose each of my commanders have had a certain influence on my life. Uh, uh, in helping me uh, to become better, I suppose. I think I would say that, that my, each of my commanders have been responsible for helping me uh, in my career as a professional Air Force officer. Colonel Reisner, in the course of your life, have you ever taken an interest in politics, political ideas and affairs? No, I, I never have. Uh, I have interested myself almost uh, none whatsoever in politics or diplomatic relations. And uh, 
I'm afraid I have uh, limited my activities, my uh, knowledge to that of a professional airman. That means in your profession you are, and we recognize this without reserve, highly specialized and highly qualified. But you are actually not at all or very slightly interested in the purpose and for which aims you let yourself be used. Uh, this has been true, uh, very much so, I'm afraid. Um, as you may know, the American people and the uh, American servicemen as well, we have been raised, you might say, to depend pretty much solely upon the decisions of others and to depend upon our government that we have elected. And for that reason, I myself and may be the case in many other cases, have not interested ourselves in political or diplomatic relations, international uh, issues, uh, as we should have. Of course, we will do much more so in the future, I assure you. Based on Squadron Commander Reisner and others who were questioned, it is not difficult to characterize the American pilot. Da Nang Air Base in South Vietnam. This is the base of the 366th Tactical Fighter Squadron, whose members call themselves the Gunfighters. The U.S. pilots, who up to now know about the Hilton Hanoi only through hearsay, also prove to have a shocking measure of indifference. We are in a position to prove our point by four short talks with American pilots interviewed for us in Da Nang. This is Major Donald McKellar, Major Ernest Olds, Major Wright, and their flight commander, Lieutenant Colonel Fred Hefner. What motive do you have for your job here in Southeast Asia? I'm Air Force. And not because of political motives. I go where I'm saying, yes. And, um, Pretty well career. What are your reasons for being here in Vietnam? Political motives? I, my reason is uh, I am a military man, and uh, this is my job to uh, come and fight wars. Major Olds, how many missions have you flown over North Vietnam? Well, this is my first one. Were you afraid you wouldn't return? Were you attacked by the Vietnamese? Yes, they did. Why are you fighting here? What were you looking for in North Vietnam? What, what was our target? What were you looking for in North Vietnam? Oh, we dropped bombs. On which targets? We had a road intersection and a truck park. And you like this new kind of work? Yes, we did. Can you tell us why? I like flying very much. You enjoy flying, but you drop bombs. Well, I think that, uh, first of all, it's my job, and secondly, we'd like to help to uh, stop communism in Southeast Asia and for the Another thing, I think we uh, would like to help the South Vietnamese uh, find some self-determination for themselves. What are you going to do now, now that your first mission is up? I think I'll go up to the club and have a beer. Thank you. Colonel Hefner, how do you like your job? Oh, my job as a squadron commander is outstanding. It's uh, the best job in the Air Force. I, I guess every fighter pilot looks forward to being a squadron commander of a fighter squadron someday in his life. I have, uh, I really enjoy it. It's a uh, very adventurous, exciting job. What do you do after returning from an exciting job, after such a mission? Oh, uh, we, uh, a normal mission, we just come back and, and uh, debrief and uh, sit down and talk about it and have a few drinks and enjoy ourselves. But uh, after you get your hunter's mission, which is a, a tour over here, 100 missions over North Vietnam, uh, we usually have a, a Rip Snorton uh, party uh, I guess you could call it equivalent to one of the German flashing parties. Following his humorous comment, Hefner again flies toward the north. In this phantom, then, sits a man who likes to have a few drinks, is pleased with the coming air pirate spree, and generally has a lot of fun in Vietnam. Well, today's mission, we had, uh, we had a uh, 20 millimeter cannon on the center line, and we were carrying six 500-pound uh, bombs. And you left all of your bombs in the north? Uh, yes, we uh, dropped all of our ordnance and expended uh, most of our 20-millimeter cannon ammunition. 
Major Wright here and his backseater. They went up and uh, cut a whole bunch of uh, barges in two up, in, uh, up off the coast of North Vietnam. And uh, my backseater, Lieutenant French and myself, we uh, expanded our 20 millimeter cannon on some gun positions along the shore, which we took a hit, by the way. I've flown uh, 99 missions north, as has Lieutenant French. He's got 99. And uh, Lieutenant Wright's got 99. And uh, Major Wright, excuse me. And uh, Lieutenant Bittner is a, uh, a new boy, as we call him, with uh, about 10 missions up north. And when you have 100, Colonel, what comes then? Well, we get 100 missions. We have quite a uh, parade back here. Uh, day after tomorrow, I hope to have a big parade back here for the three of us. <clears throat> we uh, get hosed down with a fire truck, and uh, we're paraded all over the base continually being hosed by a fire truck and some of our comrades. And uh, we have a big bottle of champagne and then we uh, get to drink between the three of us and then we'll go to the club and have a good old fashion party. They didn't make it for their jubilee. The 100 tour prank lies far distant. The Vietnamese air defenses gave these air pirates a cold shower. Major Wright, how long do you think the North Vietnamese will be able to resist? Do you have a definite opinion on this? None, really. Uh, it's sort of a loaded question. Uh, a lot of people smarter than I am can't answer it. I'm certain I can't. I really have no idea. It uh, may be very short, and it may be, again, very long. I think that's a very difficult question to answer. Well, that's kind of hard to say. Uh, I guess they'll continue to resist until their uh, bosses, or whoever their bosses are, decide it's time to quit and we've given them enough punishment. Four Thunder Chiefs, three majors and a lieutenant colonel. They enjoy flying, act like hotshot Charlies, and call themselves the gunfighters. Their squadron commander is Colonel Robert W. Malloy. Now we will get to meet him too. Welcome in Da Nang. The Colonel will make it back to his base again, not in his Phantom, but in a rescue helicopter. Commander, I wish to ask you a strictly political question, although I know that as a military man you do not feel competent to answer it. How do you explain the presence of so many American troops in South Vietnam? What are the reasons for this? Uh, I don't know the exact number, of course, of uh, uh, troops in South Vietnam, and I understand it changes uh, frequently. Uh, I really can't uh, myself explain the presence of the uh, U.S. troops in South Vietnam. As you said, as a military man, uh, they are all there, I imagine, uh, brought there uh, for the purpose which uh, uh, we were told that we were coming to uh, fight for South Vietnam. Why have more than 500,000 Americans with a gigantic arsenal of war material come to this country? An American colonel does not know. But perhaps American Lieutenant Colonel Hughes knows. I must confess, uh, no. As, as I mentioned earlier, I 
who was an engineer, deeply engrossed in my work, having just graduated from uh, electrical engineering school. And the requirement for pilots uh, has become rather heavy. And so I was, all, with very short notice, withdrawn from that job and processed rather rapidly uh, through training to come over here, none of which was a, uh, a training on the political aspect or on the um, actual uh, understanding of the people. Will you please be so kind and attempt to explain to me your presence in Southeast Asia, the presence of American troops, and your personal presence? Uh, or, uh, to answer the first part of your question, uh, my understanding was that the United States came to Vietnam at the request of uh, a friendly government again to help them uh, against outside intervention. You have just stated that the government of the United States and South Vietnam are on friendly terms. That is true. But another question is the relationship between the government of South Vietnam and its own people. I want to read to you a quote by a man, none other than the former president of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who wrote the following in his book, Mandate for Change. I have spoken to no Indochina expert who was not of the same opinion as I that if an election was held, 80% of the population would vote for the communist Ho Chi Minh. And now, please consider in which manner this estimation by Eisenhower conforms with the question of self-determination and also with the presence of American troops in South Vietnam. Yes, sir. Uh, from, uh that statement, uh, it's kind of hard for me to, uh, to justify the uh, uh, United States uh, coming in at the request of the majority of the South Vietnamese peoples. Uh, I really don't know what else I can say. Uh, kind of got me uh, uh, at an impasse. So it just, uh, that statement and, and the reasons that we are given uh, that the United States came in at the request of a friendly government that had the support of the people, they seem to be opposed to one another. Which thoughts or ideas do you get from the name Dien Bien Phu? Dien Bien Phu? Yes, sir, that's, that's not the town where I bailed out, but when I hear of Dien Bien Phu, of course, that's the famous uh, fall, of the, fall of the French uh, colonialism, or uh, the big battle, uh, the final battle between the uh, North Vietnamese people and the French people, in which the, uh, the French, in fact, did surrender uh, after that battle. It was a very famous battle for, excuse me. That means the famous battle of the French is perhaps not exactly appropriate, since it was in reality the famous battle of the Vietnamese, this victory of Dien Bien Phu. Yes, it was uh, the, the telling blow, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, uh, as I understand it, uh, for the French and the Vietnamese uh, attained their, uh, their victory, their final victory over the French at that time. The American military base of Khe Sanh has been under the fire of the South Vietnamese National Liberation Front for many weeks. U.S. President Johnson barked at his generals that he didn't want any damn Dien Bien Phu. But Johnson is already a defeated man, militarily and politically. He has already met his personal Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam. Scenes from the North. Scenes from the South.
It is a coincidence that we are holding our talk today on the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. Did you know that the Declaration of Independence of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam begins with the same words as the Declaration of Independence of the United States of North America? Ah, uh, no, I didn't know that. Then you know it now. The only difference that exists between both countries is that Vietnam is a small country in comparison and the USA is the largest capitalist country of the world. Do you think that this gives it the right to deny the small countries their independence and right to self-determination to hinder this through the force of arms? Uh, well, in this particular case, uh, the uh, United States came into this country upon the quest of the uh, government of the South Vietnam uh, people as part of our foreign policy to stop the uh, spread of uh, communism in this part of our uh, foreign policy and anything that would uh, threaten the security of the United States, either at the present or in the future. So according to this, the Americans came to this country at the request of the people of South Vietnam to stop the further development and progress of communism. Those lying here in their own blood on South Vietnamese soil are South Vietnamese. The program of the NLF for which they fought is not a communist program. It calls for elimination of the corrupt Saigon regime and the withdrawal of their accomplices so that in South Vietnam a policy of peace and neutrality, democratic domestic development, increase in productivity, and work and bread for everyone would be possible. And for this goal, they were shot down by American bullets. And that means, in the language of imperialism, struggle against communism. Our country thought it was, at the time, was uh, essential to intervene in the country to uh, stop the continuation of uh, widespread uh, of communism. Um, as our country furs it down in South Vietnam, you have the ideology of, let's say, the key regime and the... Uh... This is General Nguyen Cao Ki, after whom the Saigon regime is named. His claim to fame, South Vietnam needs two Hitlers if it is going to be freed. Here, an NLF fighter is being led away by General Ki's parachutists. And this beast, General Lone, who is South Vietnam's chief of police, shoots the prisoner in broad daylight as if he were doing a self-evident thing. This cold-blooded murderer also needs the support of his American partner, and they call the fight against the people the fight against communism. What is your personal attitude toward communism? My uh, personal uh, attitude towards communism, it, uh, it is more or less of a uh, military attitude in that uh, I uh, am in the military of a capitalist country and uh, we are opposed to communism and uh, I therefore believe that my orders, uh, uh, wherever they may assign me to uh, help prevent the spread of it, uh, are correct. Major Dewart, of course, has been taught by the DRV Air Defense Forces that an American cannot practice his military attitude against communism and go unpunished. They shot down the intruder. And the air defense forces of the German Democratic Republic are also prepared for the event should militant anti-communists stretch out their fingers toward our socialist homeland, before whose western frontier Major Dürert was also stationed for years as a NATO pilot before he went to the Vietnam theater of war. I even was sent direct from West Germany, an assignment which uh, I had been on for two and a half years. I had not even been in the United States since uh, uh, 1964. And uh, due to the type of uh, aircraft that I was uh, flying, uh, early in uh, 1965, it became obvious that uh, 
uh, everyone that flew the aircraft would eventually get a tour in Southeast Asia. And the type of aircraft being the F-105, the tour meant that our missions would all be over the DRV. Uh, this aircraft is not used in South Vietnam. And uh, we all knew this, and it was just a matter of waiting until the orders came, which they did in the end. And uh, we all moved our families to the States. That we were given adequate leave to uh, find a place for them to uh, be comfortable and then we uh, were moved on to Southeast Asia. And this has been uh, obvious to all F-105 uh, pilots for, like I say, since 1965, that we would end up here. Where were you stationed during your two and a half years in West Germany? Uh, during my uh, tour in Germany, I was stationed at Spangdalem Air Base, which is in the Eiffel Mountains uh, near Bitburg, uh, West Germany. And what was your duty there? Um, my duty was uh, a jet fighter pilot in, the, in a squadron of F-105s. Was your squadron integrated in the NATO command? Uh, my squadron, as well as uh, uh, the entire wing, was uh, uh, in the NATO uh, complex, yes. Was West Germany one of the 20 countries of the world you visited as an American world policeman? Yes, sir. What impressions do you have of West Germany? What did you see there? Which cities did you get to know? In uh, Wiesbaden, I visited, uh, I don't really remember what it was, but it's a very large uh, uh, Russian Orthodox church or something that sets up on the hill above the city, has big gold spires. I have a very beautiful picture I got of that. And uh, just visited, uh, Many of the very good places to eat and everything in Germany, a lot of the castles and things like that. Do you still remember a couple of German words or maybe a song that you heard there? Uh, the only, about the only German I learned, and I don't remember much of it now, is just to say yes and no and uh, thank you and things like that. And uh, learned to read enough things on the menu that I could eat. <coughs> but besides all of those things, you also still remember one or the other military bases in West Germany? Well, nothing except the air bases. The, the air bases uh, where I, at Ramstein and Wiesbaden and places where I knew people were stationed or something. <coughs> Ramstein, that is one of the largest NATO air bases in West Germany. From there, you certainly took a trip to Kaiserslautern. Yes, sir. I bought, uh, I bought some uh, Danish teak furniture in uh, Kaiserslautern at, uh, from Anton Dam. Uh, and, well, I never spent that much time. I went to uh, Landstuhl, ate in a very nice restaurant in Landstuhl a couple of times. Colonel Reisner, during your years of military service, you were also stationed in West Germany for some time. Yes. Where were you stationed there? I was at Hahn, Hahn, Germany. What was your duty there? I was flying a fighter there. I was just uh, part of the force. Uh, went there in uh, 1953 and returned to the United States, part of the NATO forces. You have told us that you came here to Southeast Asia because you were ordered to do so. What was the reason you went to West Germany? Did you give any thought to the political background at that time? No, uh, uh, at the time, uh, we went over as a part of a NATO force. In other words, I don't know exactly the composition of NATO, uh, nor its exact purpose. We were just, I was just a fighter pilot, and uh, uh, we, we just went over and I had good enjoy, enjoyed the flying, and uh, the, uh, we enjoyed the country and the people. Can you still remember a few German words from this period? I remember a few, uh, like uh, Einbahnstrasse, uh, Wo ist der Bahnhof? A few things that uh, uh, we needed to know in order to make our way about, but only a few words. Major Thorsnes, during your military service, you were stationed for three years in West Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 
Which German words do you still remember from the time of your duty there? Fraulein and uh, uh, good morning, you know, and uh, a few basic words like how do you do and this is uh, Schoenwetter and, and uh, just greeting words, words you'd say to someone when you met them on the streets, how are you, and the gate is seen, and just the basic words that you could walk into a store, and I used to know more words than I know now because I've forgotten them, but I could you know, go into a store and ask the price, uh, I forgot now, uh, they feel it, and things like this. But I didn't, I didn't, I never knew the German language fluently. Where were you stationed in West Germany? I was at uh, Spengdalem Flugplatz. That is a large NATO base in the Eiffel, is it not? Yes, it's, uh, it's in the Eiffel near, uh, near Bitburg in Trier. What was your job there? Which duties did you have to perform there? I was a pilot there also. Uh, uh, just as it was an air base and uh, I was a pilot, same as I was in, uh, when I was captured, uh, a pilot of 105, sir. Which forms of war were you trained for in West Germany? Well, West Germany, we were trained for, uh, well, for all forms of war, I guess. The, uh, the 105 is capable of, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, both nuclear and conventional deliveries of ordnance, and we were trained for all types of all types of war. I think you could say. Did you also have maps in your possession showing the other territory of Germany, the other part of Germany? The uh, the other part being East Germany. Uh, that was our local flying area, so to speak, and this is what we, this is what I carried maps of, of course. Uh, if a so-called X day, that is, if a dangerous situation had arisen during your assignment in West Germany, and you had been given targets in East Germany to attack cities such as Leipzig, Rostock, or Magdeburg, would you have flown? Would I have flown to, to East Germany had, <clears throat> had a war broken out? Uh, Yes, sir. That's, that was one of the reasons, of course, we were in West Germany, was the protection under the NATO of, of the West Germany and all the, all the NATO countries, and had a war broken out between uh, the communist bloc, East Germany, uh, Russia, and so on. That was, of course, why, why we were there, was to defend the NATO, the NATO organization, the NATO countries. Major Durrett, how was it actually during the time you were stationed in West Germany? Were you in possession of maps and other material about the other part of Germany? Do you know the names of such cities as Leipzig, Rostock, Magdeburg, and others? Uh, during my tour in West Germany, of course, our uh, military interests were on the other side of the so-called Iron Curtain. Uh, I do not think that uh, it's been a long time. I do not remember well, and I do not think this is a place to discover or to uh, discuss the, uh, what little I still know, uh, possibly, of uh, the NATO uh, efforts. I think it is evident to everybody that the, the uh, shall we say, the, the interest in case of uh, any uh, conflict is, is obvious, uh, the other side of the Iron Curtain. From 10 of the American bomb droppers shot down in Vietnam, Four did their job as NATO pilots in West Germany, prepared there too to give their last, their worst, as Major Dewart and Thorsness admitted to us without blinking an eye. Major Dewart, you mentioned before that the interests of the NATO forces in West Germany lie behind the Iron Curtain, to use your words. If you had been given orders to fly into the socialist countries with nuclear weapons on board, would you have done so? Uh, yes, sir, uh, I think that the situation would most certainly uh, be different than here uh, in Europe, but uh, my duty would be to obey orders, yes, sir. Major Thorsness, would you have installed nuclear warheads on your rockets if you had been ordered to do so? Bring hands. Did you have nuclear weapons on board your plane? The, the airplane, yes, sir, was capable of carrying atomic weapons. Yes, sir, the 105 is, is capable of carrying atomic weapons. During your period in West Germany, did you also go on a trip to Berlin? Yes, I did visit Berlin, sir. 
What did you see there? We saw... Uh, we went to the, to the standard tourist attractions, uh, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm uh, church, the new church and the old church, and uh, had some very good food, uh, and uh, visited East Berlin as well as West Berlin. Uh, took a tour, a military tour, uh, and primarily we were just a tourist, although it was a very interesting. Uh, this is how they are often seen as they ride through our capital with harmless faces, friendly, prepared to smile. That's right, they are members of an imperialist armed forces. But don't they look like you and I? Viewing such scenes, we would hardly have thought that this, that this type of tourist who today is walking around among us, could climb into their airplanes tomorrow somewhere in Southeast Asia to drop bombs on Vietnam. They are nice to look at. The way they take snapshots there with their cameras, they appear clean. But a dirty warrior is embodied in each of them because they are involved in a dirty business and are the functioning element whether they do their job with enthusiasm or not. Uh, well, uh, I wasn't particularly happy about it, but I uh, have a job to do in the military, and I uh, was, uh, this was my assignment, and I uh, follow and obey the orders of uh, the military, which uh, I am a member of. SS Obersturmbahnführer Adolf Eichmann. For the final solution of the Jewish problem, he organized the liquidation of six million Jews. Well, uh, I've been uh, in the military for quite a long while, and uh, I am under an obligation to obey the orders of my commanders, and I received orders uh, to come to Southeast Asia, and uh, it never, never even entered my mind to, to reject them or oppose them or anything else. I just accepted them. <clears throat> in our opinion, your standpoint makes possible the death of guiltless people, because you blindly follow orders. Well, yes, so that's, as a professional military man, that's how I feel, or felt. <clears throat> Anti-Vietnam War demonstrators in Washington. On their posters, I only followed orders, Eichmann. Well, I, I think that that is the duty. If you're in the military, you obey your orders. I, I can't say that I understood fully the, the whole situation. I, I can't say that I understand it now. But uh, I feel that as a duty of a military officer, you, you, you carry out your orders. You may not understand exactly what they are, but you do. Buttons worn by American opponents of the Vietnam War. I only followed orders, Eichmann. Then as a professional officer, you simply carried out your orders without thinking why or against what you were being used. This was secondary for you, or maybe not even interesting at all. You just unconditionally carried out your orders. Uh, like, like I said, yes. Uh... This Air Force officer had enough courage to say no. Captain Dale Noyd refused to train student pilots for the war in Vietnam. His reason, I am prepared to fight in every war in which the United States is attacked, but in Vietnam, this is not the case. Captain Noyd is facing court-martial, but his standpoint is food for thought. Was the attitude of these people talked about at the Air Force Base? Was this question discussed or talked about? Uh, not a whole lot, sir. We sometimes discuss it. Mainly our discussions centered on the fact that uh, they were hurting uh, the war effort, uh, prolonging the war, uh, because we felt that uh, the kind of war they're fighting here is not essentially a test of strength, but is a kind of a test of determination, and that uh, by people in the United States demonstrating 
refusing to go to Vietnam, it indicates to the other side that perhaps our determination is not that strong. Sir. That was our, the way we discussed it, sir. The determination to bring the Vietnam War to an end is also growing in the United States. Anti-war demonstrators. Their destination, the Pentagon in Washington. David Summers, Michael Johnson, Dennis Mora. They are presently serving long prison sentences because they refuse to fight against the Vietnamese people. What is your opinion of these three American citizens who refused to go to Vietnam and chose to go to prison instead? I don't know what their reason was, but they are free to do that and express opinion not to go, but they also have to re receive the punishment for not going. Who do you think is now more free in conscience? The three who said, we are not participating in this dirty war? Those are the words of the three. Or those like you who went to war and who are now also not exactly the freest? No, I'm not free yet. I hope someday I will be. However, uh, these people aren't free either. Maybe perhaps in their mind that they did the right thing, but uh, they uh, disobeyed the whole idea of our country, of our concept of our country. We'll, we'll fight for our country under the order of our president. No, I'm not free. And uh, I wasn't free when I was in Thailand either. I was under a military system. However, uh, I feel that I have served my country and whether it be right or wrong, I've done my duty, and these people have not. Right or wrong, he only did his duty. For all of the heir parents we interviewed, loyalty is an empty formula needed by them to appease occasional feelings of bad conscience, because it excuses everything. And yet, in the situation of captivity, even First Lieutenant Abbott begins to reflect about himself and his actions. First Lieutenant Abbott wrote this letter to his wife, Linda, in the United States. If the bombing would cease, the road to peace, I'm sure, would be opened. From there, this would lead to the end of the war, and my return home to you, Mom and Dad. No officer would write words such as these if he believed his superiors were on Victory Street. First Lieutenant Hubbard wants peace talks. Uh, yes, I'd like to see the end of the conflict of bombing and peace negotiations to stop this, uh, let's say, as you call it, the dirty war. Major Dewart, how long do you think you will still have to wear these pajamas? I have no idea how long I will be uh, uh, in the forced to live in this country uh, as a prisoner. But uh, I know that I am alive, and uh, as long as I'm able to maintain uh, hope for getting back to my family, uh, hope for the, the end of this war, uh, uh, I think that I will be taken care of.
permit me to make a very personal statement. Anyone looking at you with your blue eyes would get the feeling you wouldn't hurt a fly. But you are sitting in front of us as a man who has dropped cluster bombs on this territory, and in spite of this, speaks of his joy in flying. I fear that with people like you, any kind of war can be carried out. And I would like to ask you in conclusion a very serious question. When the time comes for you to take off this suit of clothing, what is your life going to be like? What are your plans for the future? I hope that uh, my country will still have a use for, him, uh, for me in the uh, service when I go back. However, if they do not, I will have to look for something else to uh, do. I can always still fly, uh, but of course now it will cost me money when I have to do it on my own. Uh, I am approaching the age where I uh, cannot uh, easily get a job with uh, uh, airlines and so on. I may be able to for three or four more years, which I would certainly try if uh, I was not of any use in the military. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, how my life will change, uh, one thing that will definitely change is that uh, I'm going to spend more time in church. I pray that uh, there would not be another war that I would have to serve in. In future, the U.S. global strategists will probably have to do without this man who has expressed his distaste of the war in Vietnam in such a plain manner. And how does Colonel Reisner think about his future, this man who has such a long military career behind him? I may be like others, I don't know. However, I have no plans at this moment. My plans for the future depend on uh, many things. Uh, since since uh, coming here as a captive, I have uh, searched myself very deeply. And as I said before, I have always been a Christian, but I, I have learned to know God as I did not know him before. And my future depends a great deal on what I feel that God wants me to do. Whether it involves the Air Force or not, I don't know. Then you feel you have no personal responsibility for your destiny and place it in the hands of higher powers. That is correct. Reisner will hardly be useful again as the squadron commander of air pirates. A fighting cock? No, not anymore. First Lieutenant Torkelson to his wife, Merrill. Protesting and demonstrating this war and talking to people about the cruelty of it would help to end it sooner. I love you and miss you. Lauren. American prisoners of the Korean War were court-martialed for letters such as these. It is very likely that First Lieutenant Torkelson will have to be struck from the rolls of the Air Force. Lieutenant Colonel Hughes also rejects Johnson when he writes to his wife. I would appreciate your doing what you can to help end this conflict. Most affectionately, Jim and Daddy. Major Thorsness, what plans do you have for life after this war has ended? What would you like to do most of all if someday you could take off these pajamas? Well, I would like to, uh, someday in the future, uh, I'm either going to be a, uh, an instructor in a high school or college. I think this would be a very rewarding job to teach children. And if, it, if it's not that, then I would like to be in politics. I would like very much to be a, a senator someday or a governor of a state. Uh, I would like to be on the, on the deciding end of United States policy rather than on the, the doing end. Uh, I would like very much to, uh, to help form 
United States policy, have a voice informing United States policy, other than just as a voter. I would like to be uh, in the political field itself. What policy would the politician Thorsness want to conduct? Would he follow Johnson's line? Hardly. For in a letter to his wife, the Major wrote, Gailey, speaking personally, you may be able to get an appointment to see either senator from your state or possibly Senator Symington and pass on to them that you, for one, and me, would like to see this war justly ended as soon as possible. Prayerfully, yours with love, Leo. First Lieutenant Shively wrote to his parents in the United States. I pray daily for the end of the war and hope that you do also. There are other ways in which you can help to shorten the war also. You can write letters to our senators and congressmen and to the newspapers expressing your opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam. Remember me in your prayers with love, Jim. First Lieutenant Shively has had enough. It can hardly be expected that he will ever put on his helmet again and transform himself into a Thunder Chief. Has he also considered what he will make of his life someday? Sir, that's a, a difficult question. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure that I don't want to fly combat again. I've had my taste and uh, not particularly pleased with it. Uh, I think I would like to live a quiet life from now on without guns going off, being shot at, uh, living in the constant day-to-day -day worry of will I return tomorrow uh, from a mission. Probably uh, I've just thought about this. Uh, and felt that maybe I'd like to uh, be an apple orchard uh, farmer back in my home state of Washington, sir. Something quiet and simple. We wish you the best of luck in this. Thank you, sir. The end of the Thunder Chiefs. The end of a legend. American superiority. Invincibility. The bubble has burst. Anyone putting on these pajamas also has time to think. A lot of time. The former world policemen in the Hilton Hanoi are also permitted to study the world maps hanging on the walls of various cells. They are a portion of Vietnam development aid for the educational system of the United States. In the United States, did you, you and your family, ever feel personally threatened by the Vietnamese people? No, sir, I never, I wasn't even real sure where Vietnam was until I got my orders to come over here and I got my world book out and looked it up to see exactly where I was going. <clears throat> this first lieutenant of the U.S. Air Force didn't even know where Vietnam was. But what was he supposed to have known about the people who live in this country? About Captain Nguyen Phan Bai, for instance, who was born and raised under Vietnam's sky? He too is a pilot with heart and soul, and he is more than just this. He is a communist. He, a communist, flies to defend his country. He flies to protect the children and their mothers from the cluster bombs and the rockets, which drop from the thunder chiefs and intruders at every hour. In short, he defends his homeland against terror attackers, and this is an honest, a clean responsibility. When we asked him to tell us how many air pirates he has already shot down, he made a couple of notes on the palm of his hand, which has effectively worked like a slap in the face for more than one of the aggressors. Ngày 26 tháng 4 năm 1966 vẫn rơi một A4. À ngày 29 tháng 4 năm 1966 thì vẫn rơi một F105. Ngày 16 tháng 9 năm 1964, 66 thì vẫn rơi một F4. Và cái ngày mùng 5 tháng 9 
năm 1966 thì bắn rơi 1 4 ông áp 8 ngày 1 tháng 1 ngày 21 tháng 1 năm 1967 thì bắn rơi 1 năm ngày 24 24 tháng 4 năm 1967 thì bắn rơi 1 4 À, ngày 29 tháng 4 năm 1967 bắn rơi 1 F4. Seven shot down, seven victories, seven times honest work, seven times the same feeling of pride the bridge builder has after completing his work. Captain Bai was worthy of the flowers he received from President Ho Chi Minh, which grew on the topsoil, on the holy land, from which a small people draws its great strength. Vietnam. Here, the words of the German poet Hölderlin are becoming living reality, that the just ones wield their swords like magicians. At the time of our visit, the regiment of which this rocket unit is a member had already shot down 30 air pirates. One of them, who as the saying goes, fell out of the clouds, was First Lieutenant Hubbard, the unpolitical American elite officer. Are you interested in political affairs now, based on your present day experiences? Well, since I'm here, I would be much more than I ever was before, yes, sir. I think when I get out of here, I will probably take a much greater interest in things that I before felt were not my main interest. <clears throat> How long do you think you will have to wear these pajamas? I am looking forward to getting out of them sometime in the summer or fall of 1969. <clears throat> How did you figure this date out? Well, uh, the only thing I can base it on is if, if uh, in the election next year in November of 68, there's a new president elected, and if his feelings are strong enough against the war, or his stand is such that he ends the war, I am assuming that it will end similar to the way Korea did approximately a year after change of administration. Edward Lee Hubbard hopes for a new president, and expresses thereby the hopes of numerous pilots in pajamas. These men wrote a camp song for themselves, which is sure to turn the ears of the global strategists in Washington red. As a rejection, as the funeral march of a defeated policy. When I crashed in the Red River Valley, my jet had been hit by a sound. I was captured by a posse of peasants, and my life as a prisoner began. Being tied and led off to their village, I was frightened and feared for my life. I was doctored and fed by their fireside, just as though I had caused them no strife. I have moved to the Hanoi Hilton, with its radio close shades and good books. New clothes, twin blankets, and toothpaste. Hot soup, good rice from the cooks. As I study and read of their history, their long struggle for unity and peace, their high hopes and great plans for the future, I pray that this war will soon cease. Someday when the peace talks have ended, I'll return to the ones I love dear. I'll remember the Red River Valley and the people who live peacefully there.